Hello everyone, this is episode 10 of my Crimid series, and I'm sorry for my recent absence, I haven't been making too many videos, uh, I've been quite busy at the moment, but for the next few days I'm free, so I should be making quite a few videos in my Crimid series. Anyway, in this episode we are planning to go to Jewel, and not just visit Jewel, but also land on all of its moons. This is otherwise known as, if you go onto the forums, you'll see the Jewel 5 Challenge where you have to land on all of the moons and return. Quite a big challenge, it all has to be done in one launch, and yeah, certainly requires a lot of Delta V. However, since I performed the mission last episode where I went to Moho, Drez, and Elu, uh, the Delta V requirement I don't think is quite as large. Also, since the dual system is quite tightly packed, I can use a lot of gravity assist, so it shouldn't be too bad. You can see I've also, in an attempt to make this rocket very efficient, I've made my landers very small. You can see I build this rocket slightly differently than usual, using sub-assemblies. Um, and both of those little things you can see perched on the cockpit there. Each are a Tylo lander and a Lathe lander, respectively. So, yeah, they are tiny and uh, don't look like they can escape from Tylo. Tylo being the same size as Kerbin and having a lot of gravity. It, it also doesn't have an atmosphere, so I've got to slow down and then get back just with that little thing. Yeah, but since I've kept the weight so low, it should be doable. And there we go, the rocket is done. We've called it Zeus in honor of the uh, Greek version of Jupiter, obviously what Jules is inspired by. You may have heard of him, he's definitely the most famous Greek deity. And we've recruited Dudri Kerman for this quite grand uh, mission. We still have a little bit of time warping to do though. Uh, we've got to wait until Jewel is roughly 90 degrees, although that shouldn't be too long. That looks good. We might have overshot it a little bit. But here we go. We've launched. This should be a pretty good mission. We should get lots of science. What? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, I thought. No. Oh, no. Okay. Explosions have happened. Things have gone explodey. Oh, look at that. Ouch. Oh man. Doofy Kerman. Gone. Oh, that's all that's left. There should be a should be a Kerbal in that seat. Oh wow. Sad times. Well that was unexpected. That's all that's left, those two pieces of debris falling down. Yes, that was indeed quite a shame. Not even a slow motion frame by flame analysis helps to explain what happened there. It just looks like it exploded for no reason and then the rocket crashes into itself. Yeah. Anyway, if we're quick, I think that the Kerbals won't realise what's just happened and will still be up for joining me on the next mission. Whilst that did cost about half a million funds there, down the drain, we do have plenty saved up. We've got almost another million, so we can launch another rocket. However, we will need to go to the recruitment centre as well, just do that quickly, and yeah, if we're brief and do it before they realise that the rocket exploded, they might still be willing. We go for someone fairly stupid so they won't realise. Guston Kerman, still a bit of courage, but yeah, stupid enough to not realise the peril he's potentially putting himself in. This rocket definitely needs a bit of a change. I end up having, a, sorry, adding a lot of external fuel tanks to the rocket just because I didn't think it had quite enough delta V. I don't have a Val lander, so I'm going to be deorbiting the whole rocket, which will be much lighter by that point, but still uh, requires some landing legs. As you can see, I've attached more fuel and more nuclear engines. I've gone for a sort of tri system. Uh, that should be enough to give me a thrust to weight ratio, just enough to escape Val, which actually has about the same gravity as Elu. So, yeah, no mean feat. Much harder than a standard moon landing. And there we go, Guston Kerman in Zeus Mark II. I've also put a few more struts over the place and given it some launch clamps. That should make it stable on the launch pad and prevent what we've just seen. We're going to be doing a bit more time warping as well because I think I did overshoot it. I realised that you should be just, the angle between you and Jewel should be just more than 90 degrees rather than just less. And on things like this, this sort of scale where Jewel is at times the furthest planet from the sun, uh, those small changes make a big difference. 
we're coming around to it now, and there we go. That looks good, we're on the daytime side of Kerbin. Let's just hope the launch goes well. Things are going well so far. Everything is lots of struts, it shouldn't be too bad, and yes, everything's fine. The launch it should be pretty good. Anyway, since due to the scale of this mission, uh, I'm also going to be provided that everything goes well, and so far, I've got to say, it doesn't look good, things are really broken up. Um, but yeah, if everything goes well, I'll be submitting my entry to the Dual 5 Challenge on the Kerbal forums. And yeah, that should be nice, I'll get a little banner. Um, but that's certainly quite an achievement. Yeah, other than that mishap initially, the launch trajectory has gone fairly well. I slowed down a bit there just because I was worried that those fuel tanks would collide in my engine and blow it up. But yeah, other than that, fairly standard. And we end up just depleting that fuel stage now. And this stage that we've just got on should get us most of the way to a dual encounter. There we go, nice circular orbit. Just finishing off, there we go. And yeah, let's say this should be just enough to get to Joule, and then we have to switch over to the nuclear engines, which are very slow, but very efficient, so that should be good. Getting in a Joule encounter is very easy because of how huge its river entrance is, but getting a nice equatorial one is a little harder, so it requires a bit of tweaking, and requires us to launch from Kerbin off at a slightly odd angle. But that's no matter. This should still be good. It also doesn't matter the speed at which we encounter Joule because of its extremely dense, being a gas giant, atmosphere. I've done some aero braking moves in the past with my Duna mission, but this is the first one we'll be doing many because Laith, one of Joule's moons, also has an atmosphere. There we go. We've actually had to do a little bit more work with the new engines than I first thought because they attach loads of extra fuel, but that's yeah, that's no problem. We only had a little bit more work to do, and we should just get into a pretty good dual encounter soon. Need a bit more tweaking once we get into solar orbit, but other than that, should be fine. Anyway, since this all took a very long time, and the wait times took ages again, similar to what I did in my last mission, I read up a bit on dual, and yeah, I mean, I discovered that, surprisingly, it's actually, it is huge. I mean, I realised Jupiter was big, but it actually has two and a half times the mass of every other planet in the real solar system combined. So it's a Saturn and, and everything. And that's quite shocking. Also, if you put the real solar system Joule, sorry, a Jupiter next to the Kerbal solar system Kerbal, the Sun, you'd realize that Jupiter is actually bigger than the in game Sun, which is quite impressive. That is just how big it is. So, yeah, I mean, it quite shocking really um, but yeah I mean pretty cool so yeah the lot the burn time sorry waiting times were as I said very long you can see you're watching I think about eight times what I had to watch and we've got full time warp so yeah it's sort of excruciating once you get out to these heights above the Sun but it is quite nice in map view to see all of our flags on those planets other than Jewel and Eve, everything has a little white little marker on it which signifies Kerbal's footsteps have been there. It's quite nice. We only have a bit more work to do and then we have to focus on an Eve return mission and we have to visit Gilly in the same launch, which is... Well, we don't have to actually, but I like challenging myself. But yeah, that's no mean feat. That's going to require quite a bit of planning. And yeah, I mean... Yeah, that's a proper challenge. That's one of the hardest things you can do in KSP, I think, in EVE Return, just because of how much gravity EVE has and the thick atmosphere. Anyway, we've now entered Jules' sphere of influence, and I'm just getting my periapsis down a little bit so that we can perform a nice aero braking maneuver. I intend to aero brake so that I end up at a roughly lathe altitude. Uh, apoapsis above Joule so that I'm, I can encounter Laith easily. You can see my encounter with Joule is almost perfectly equatorial uh, with very little inclination which should mean encountering all the moons is very easy. Yeah I forgot to talk about earlier but we've got loads of contracts on this mission several for science around Joule, some to plant flags on moons and science around other moons yeah so this should be very profitable. 
I don't have any um, science gear on my rocket, nor did I bring any crew capsules, and my landers don't have any, so I won't be taking any from the moons. That does reduce the total science output from this mission. Uh, well, it will, I think, but um, since we have enough from our last mission to pretty much complete the entire tech tree, we won't need it. I didn't complete the tech tree this time around because I only took parts that I needed, but um, yeah, I think we have pretty much the amount of science needed, so I'm only going to be taking some extra surface samples, and the contracts will give me some science as well, but I'm not going to be going out of my way to get extra science points this time. In my opinion, I think the tech tree is actually a bit too easy to complete. I mean, it didn't. It doesn't take too long. When the new NASA engines released in 0.235, I was hoping they'd be added as an extra branch from the tech tree, but no, it was sort of just merged in and main sales were added earlier, which is kind of annoying. Not complaining, but sort of. I do think the game, so the tech tree is a bit easy. Anyway, we're now after another pass around and some more error breaking and a bit of a burn we get into a good altitude, which should be fit for a lathe encounter after a few more orbits time. Yeah, lathe also has a very thick app, well, fairly thick. It's slightly less than Kerbin's, but relative to most other planets, that is quite a lot. That should also allow us to do some aerobic maneuvers there, and saves us a lot of fuel. However, it does mean it is the most unpredictable stage in the mission, because aerobraking depends having a fuel, a, a, a tiny increase, like a few hundred meters difference in your altitude when you're air braking, or a few extra meters per second approaching it, has a huge difference on what, you're ended, what you end up having in terms of an orbit after air braking. So it's definitely the most unreliable, I can't predict how this is going to go, so, which is why I need to do a few extra passes around Joule, but yeah, it should be fine after a few more lathe. Uh, or dual orbits. Again, I've got to make sure my orbit around late is counterclockwise and equatorial because my little lander I send off is going to have to dock and rendezvous with it in orbit. And I did quite a bit of that in my last episode, sure, but I'm still not too much of a fan. It is very fiddly and time consuming. Lots of this video is sped up, but uh, for me it did take quite a while and it doesn't, it's not too much fun. I appreciate it's useful, but that's partly why my VAL section doesn't have a lander. I don't know if it'll work, but it doesn't have a lander because I'll be aiming to deal with the whole thing, which in hindsight isn't a good strategy, but I hope it works. Anyway, we're now coming in for a nice lake at Leith Aero Break with a nice view of Jewel there hanging over us, which we might be able to land on one of the islands overlooking Jewel, which would be quite nice for Guston here. After a little bit of aero braking, which required a little bit of extra input from liquid fuel to reduce our apparatus, we get into a pretty good lathe orbit. I think this will be good enough straight away, we won't need to circularize or anything. Just raise our periapsis a bit so our orbiter doesn't fall into the atmosphere and take some science, and then we should be good to go. The lathe lander, I showed it very briefly as I was building it, but you'll get a good look at it now, is tiny. It, oh, the fuel in it is very low indeed. The whole thing, I've tried to make it as light as possible. It has a small module that we use to deal with the thing, another module that we use to take off from lathe, and then after that, a little tiny stage that will be used to uh, finish off my orbit circularize and hopefully rendezvous with the orbiter that you can see at the moment. Basically the rest of the ship. I've also attached a probe core just underneath the crew capsule so that I'll be able to control the ship um, without having to have a curl in it just in case things go wrong. Cause a bit of uh, fiddling around to get to to board the external command seat but it's worth doing because the external command seat is very light, allows me to control it without having to increase too much mass. I increase the mass of my rocket, sorry, and should be very efficient. Uh, yeah, so now I'm using these liquid fuel engines to just deorbit my ship a little. This is much more efficient than using the actual rocket to deorbit, decoupling then reorbiting it again because that's quite fuel extensive. 
so yeah, this is fine. I should just fall down on that island nicely. I've got some parachutes which will slow my descent, so I'm going to use fuel for that. The atmosphere is very thick, and it should be good. Oh, a little bit of a mishap there. When I decoupled, poor Gaston was sent flying off, but luckily this all happened above the atmosphere. And yeah, we're back in. So now it's just a case of speeding things up and falling onto that island. Quite violent re-entry there, using Guston's helmet as the main uh, heat shield. Uh, but he seems to be enjoying it, and it doesn't matter too much. He's a kerbal, he's made of hardy stuff. Anyway, we can now use the three parachutes to descend. We've got some light landing gear as well. The parachutes do actually weigh quite a bit. They weigh, I think, 0.1 tons each, so I decouple them uh, once I land so that I don't have to take that mass up with me. You can see the jet engine state of this lander uses one toroidal fuel tank, that little orange ring, which has 10 units of fuel. That 10 units of fuel should be enough to get this entire thing pretty high up. From here, this place actually looks quite a bit like Kerbin, a sort of um, holiday or one, a nice beach getaway, with Tyler there filling in for the mun. That's not very similar. Anyway, now that we've landed, we can crucially take some science and <laughs> get off rather unelegantly, but there's no one else to here to see. We can now plant a flag, which is of course the main priority and why we're even here. That's what the goal of this series is for, and that's what we're doing. You can see that uh, Leith has, from the descriptions that only appeared for about a second, but it is actually really warm. It has liquid water on the surface, which could be explained by the tidal heating effects due to being so close to Joule. The real life Io is so close to Jupiter that it actually experiences so much tidal flexing that its interior is stretched so much that the rock experiences so much friction that it actually heats up as if it had a molten core. That makes the uh, whole plat moon... Oh! <laughs> Interesting. Uh, that makes the whole moon uh, extremely hot and very volcanic, which could be partly due to explain why Leith is so hot and habitable, habitable it seems. Anyway, that's all I've got time for this episode. Uh, there's not enough time to try and take off and dock with the orbiter, so for that I'll have to see then where we attempt to dock, and if things go well, land on Val and Tylo. Anyway, thanks for watching, I'll see you then. Goodbye.